for a total change in pace because what we need to do now is get into a brand new topic called phase diagrams. Really, this is the topic of thermodynamics. Our crystallization, our magmatic processes happen deep underground, and we can't see what's happening. And so we need to find ways to explain what's happening. We can do that texturally. We can do it with experiments. We can also do it mathematically with a series of thermodynamic calculations. So in the textbook, these are the pages that get into phase diagrams and thermodynamics. For notes, for me, this is a huge, big heading. And we'll start off with Roman numeral 1, thermodynamics. And really, this is just an introduction to what thermodynamics is. We're not going to do the calculations. Um, but basically, the thermodynamics is a, is a set of mathematical models that describe how rocks could form. And the simplest rule, I think, for thermodynamics is actually named the second law of thermodynamics. And it states that nature drives towards the lowest possible energy. Nature drives. All right, that's the process nature always wants to do. It's always going to drive towards the lowest possible energy uh, situation towards lowest possible energy. We can think of this in a variety of different ways. You can think about it in terms of energy. We've got all sorts of different types of energy, right? We've got potential energy where boulder will roll downhill um, and the energy will turn from potential energy to kinetic energy. There is chemical energy. In fact, Sometimes we think about it as chemical potential energy. There's thermal energy, there's electric energy, there's nuclear energy, there's magnetic energy, okay? Just there's all these different energies. And no matter what system we're talking about, nature wants to drive that to the lowest possible. This rule of thumb is actually named the second law of thermodynamics. Again, not something we're getting into here, but certainly something to get into in your geology careers. Thermodynamics. And if you want to, you could just do a, a lot of times, this is the simplest drawing that's in a hill, boulder on top of hill. Nature wants to put it at the bottom of the hill. Uh, we need to define this a little more formally. So we'll just put, in, and there will be pictures, I promise. But uh, for now, we're just writing some notes. What is thermodynamics? It's a set of mathematical models. That means equations. And we use those equations, those mathematical models, to explain how nature uh, works. And the nature we care about specifically here is how temperature, pressure, and composition affects the magmatic system. So for us, a set of mathematical models that describe how changing, or how changes in, how changes in temperature, pressure, and composition affect a petro petrologic system. Yeah, it's not just a magma. It could certainly be a metamorphic system as well. And we're going to say this in a, in a somewhat thermodynamic -y way, which is how Tp and X affect the state of equilibrium. How it affects the state of equilibrium in a system. And I feel like this has some jargon in it as well. Let's define system and let's define equilibrium. System, in, in our case, can is, is a petrologic system. And a petrologic system is a tectonic environment. If we're dealing with metamorphic rocks, it can be a magma chamber if we're dealing with igneous rocks. And equilibrium, this is just an important little definition. This is the state of no change. Now, when we get into the mathematics, or when you will, later in your careers, the thing you need to worry about, or that we will worry about the most, is something called Gibbs free energy. College chemistry is a class that's a prerequisite for petrology because of Gibbs free energy, almost more than anything else. Um, what is it? Well, again, we're not going to get into it heavy here, but it's a thermodynamic potential energy. potential energy. It's kind of like telling you how a chemical reaction will roll downhill. That's what Gibbs free energy does. And what Gibbs free energy does, it says everything's rolling downhill. Well, how do we say that in Gibbs free energy speak? We say that all reactions go to a negative Gibbs free energy. That's the way we say rolls downhill. 
So all reactions go to a negative Gibbs. A lot of times this is said, so how do you say that in, in like um, shorthand? We would say a negative delta G. That would be how we say that. And if we were in equilibrium and there is a state of no change, well, equilibrium will look like delta G equals zero. Okay, so that's our background on thermodynamics. And the reason why this is important is because thermodynamics is the backbone for all phase diagrams that you're going to see. Now we're going to do one example here using diamonds and graphite to talk a little bit more about thermodynamics and Gibbs free energy. So let me snag this. Here's an image from the textbook that uses pictures to explain right, Gibbs free energy and metastability and equilibrium. And here is one of the largest diamonds found in the 21st century. Right? Humongous, beautiful diamond coming out of Africa. And the idea would be, like, um, I guess maybe the question we would say is, diamond, the reaction of diamond to graphite. And we could put some questions like, why does it occur? How fast does it occur? These would be questions we want to ask in geology. Should diamond even exist at the Earth's surface? Now, chemically, this reaction is very simple, right? It's carbon that goes to carbon, where we have a type of packing of the carbon atoms that's very dense for diamond and a type of packing that's less dense for graphite. And the question is, should diamond even exist at the Earth's surface? And the answer is no. Okay, the answer is no, diamond shouldn't exist at the Earth's surface because the Gibbs free energy of this reaction, of going from this reactant to this product, actually has a delta G equals minus 2.9 kilojoules per mole. So, since it has this negative delta G, this means graphite is thermodynamically stable at the Earth's surface. Thermodynamically stable stable at Earth's surface. And we show that pictorially up here, where here's our higher delta G, this would be our unstable, and here's our lower delta G, this would be stable at Earth's conditions. And we see that graphite, um, and this, this line right here represents the topography of the Gibbs free energy. So, so here's our lowest Gibbs free energy. Graphite's the thing that should be stable. And diamond is not stable. But notice this, this is an this is kind of our interesting thing right here. EA. EA stands for, we could put this here. Uh, so this EA in the picture is an activation energy. Activation energy. And it's an energy that must be overcome in order for. A reaction to proceed. What we also can think about, this is a, a kinetic block on the reaction, where thermodynamics says absolutely it should happen. Kinetics says it can't happen fast enough. So kinetics is kind of like the, um, there's like a left hand and a right hand, thermodynamics would be one, and kinetics is the other. Kinetics is the chemistry of how fast a reaction can occur, and thermodynamics says should it occur. So the reaction should occur, it cannot happen fast enough, because this activation energy that allows diamond to, that, that must be overcome, right, the boulder has to roll uphill, is actually humongous. It's like 370 kilojoules per mole. And in this little schematic here, it's only shown as a small hill, but absolutely, it's actually huge, which is why this feature, which is only stable deep in the Earth's mantle, can persist for billions of years at the Earth's surface, even though thermodynamics say it can't. So how, what is diamond? Diamond is actually metastable at the Earth's surface. And, and that's what this vocabulary word is right here. We just want to add it. We want to say that um, metastable is something that is thermodynamically unstable but kinetically favored. Uh, maybe we shouldn't even put that definition in. It makes too much sense within the word itself. But if you want to write it in, go ahead. And what I want you to say here is that if a substance is metastable, then the reaction for it is kinetically blocked by an activation energy. And that can be huge or it can be small. And it's our ally. 
And that, so that's the word I want you to put down here, because if we didn't have metastable, if we didn't have in activation energies, all the minerals at the Earth's surface would be super boring, you know, kind of pieces of crap. Things like gypsum and calcite, barite, sedimentary minerals. Because we have metastability blocking those reactions from occurring, we actually can preserve fascinating igneous and metamorphic minerals, mantle minerals even, at the Earth's surface. So there you go. That's our theory and our background this semester on phase diagrams. Now let's actually dive into what is a phase diagram. So Roman numeral 2 is phase diagram introduction. Introduction. We're just going to label the pieces of the phase diagram and be done for the day. Um, these have been developed experimentally. And they tend to, in this class, be TX diagrams. And what a TX diagram means, if we were to draw in the phase diagram right here, one of the axes will be temperature, and the other axis will be composition. All right? So, so we could say, like, this is our Y axis, and this would be our X axis. And the X axis is going to be some kind of solid solution. For example, going from anorthite to albite, or some, al some, some other mineral to another mineral along a solid solution. How is pressure handled in this type of phase diagram? Well, usually you say pressure is constant, maybe like at 2 kilobars or 200 megapascals. And so the only parameters we're varying are Tx. You can absolutely have Tp diagrams or Px diagrams, but in our textbook, in this discussion, they are Tx diagrams. Now this X, so what is X? X is formally defined as a component, and a component is a smallest chemical, this is a definition from the textbook, smallest chemical entity um, to describe the system. All right, the system could be, example, the system could be a magma, in fact, let's make it be a basaltic magma, and the bet and that has, has all sorts of uh, oxides in it: MgO, FeO, SiO2, Al2O3. But the simplest way to describe a basaltic magma um, has been found to be uh, diopside is one component, and that goes in solid solution to anorthite. And, and and I guess we could write what are those actual components? Well, that's CaMgSi2O6 in solid solution with CaAl2Si2O8. Okay, so, so those are examples of a little bit of an introduction to the phase diagram. Let's keep going. On the phase diagram, there are going to be different lines and domains. So let's draw that. Uh, we're just building here, okay? So we've defined that this is a T- X diagram with solid solution, but on these diagrams, there tends to be lines. I'm going to just put in some lines. This is a very simple set of lines from a binary phase diagram. We'll be working on an example like this. And, and so what we have up here is, is a domain. All this up here, above this line, well, this is going to be the domain of a liquid. And down here, below this line, at colder temperatures, this is a whole nother domain, and every space in Tx, every point in Tx space here, this is solid. And in this domain, we've got liquid plus crystals. I guess we get solid equals crystals, by the way. And over here, we have another area where liquid and crystals can exist. So it's showing spaces that where thermodynamically defined uh, materials are stable. So what we're going to say here is, what do the lines and domains do? Well, they show stability, thermodynamic stability. And they're showing stability specifically of something that the textbook defines as a phase. And a phase is a part of a system, part of a system, system that is chemically and physically homogeneous. Chemically and physically homogeneous. So things that are phases are the melt, which I gave the symbol liquid. Uh, it can be the different crystals. So a so let's just say like a plagioclase crystal would be a phase. 
a quartz crystal would be a phase, an olivine crystal would be a phase, a bubble would also be a phase. And then, so the last thing we're going to do here is we're just going to draw one last, uh, you know what, let's actually put in a real one. Here we go. Here is the binary phase diagram that we're going to use a lot for this class and for the next two lectures, actually. And so we've got our different uh, boundaries. We, we need to label a couple more things. This point right here, this is the thermodynamic trough. It's a, it's a stability point. And that point is called the eutectic point. The eutectic point is also known as an invariant point. So let's say invariant point. Why do my notes get so messy here? This should be a number two, okay? And it can still be in the same color of ink. And the, the process that happens at the invariant, the eutectic point, the invariant point, is we're going to say much melting or crystallization. That, um, and in fact, if you look at it in terms of temperature, is it the highest temperature or the lowest temperature of crystallization? Well, it's the lowest because a crystal forms at this surface and any surface underneath it. And so you can see this is the lowest point with which a liquid can exist. This field here we'd label liquid press crystal. This field here is liquid press crystal. And you notice below this black line, everything is 100% solid diopside and northing. If you want to, go ahead and search on Google for binary phase diagram, diopside and northite. And if you do that, I promise you this diagram will show up. A couple more things to label on this diagram are going to be the words isotherm and isopleth. I'm going to use these in the upcoming lectures to describe where I want you to work. So an isotherm is a line of equal temperature. Equal. Nah. Equal temperature. And so a line of equal temperature might be something like this. All right. The whole time, that is the isotherm for 1500 degrees Celsius. And an isopleth is a line of equal composition. So if I told you to put a line at anorthite 80 diopside 20, you would say, okay, here's anorthite 100, here's anorthite 80. And if it's anorthite 80, it has to be diopside 20. And so this right here would be the isopleth of our example. Okay, I think that's enough for today. Go ahead and read that textbook. A lot of this will make more sense. You'll get in a little more depth, and we'll do an example next lecture.